Mr. A coming at you again with a video. My, my hope is today to give you a short rundown on things that are going to be very important for you to know for your test. Um, I'd like you to start by opening up to page 608 of your book. I'm going to use your book a little bit today and I'm going to talk about some things that are going to help you through, like I said, your test on uh, is due on Thursday. Uh, of the uh, Thursday at 11:59 this week, and and of course, uh, you know, since we're talking about plants, I had to you know bring my flower prints with you, my seed cap, uh, and give you a good understanding and run through of plants. So I hope you guys enjoy this. Throughout the video, there is uh, there's going to be a handful of questions that you need to do. Uh, you can write those down. They got to e be emailed to me by Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. So I hope you enjoy this, this uh, riveting video that's going to be, quite frankly, plantastic. Um, on page 608, uh, what you guys will see is something that looks similar to this. Now, <clears throat> a lot of this stuff that I'm going to talk about today, I already went through in my previous video with you. Um, but I wanted to give you a quick rundown of a couple things that I was hearing that maybe you were a little bit off on when you guys were giving your explanations of. Um, the first is there are two major divisions of plants. Non-vascular is the first, and that would be things like moss, liverworts, and hornworts. I want you to know one phyla name. Your book talks about this, but the bryophytes. Moss belong to the phyla bryophyte. Um, so that's one division is your non-vascular division. You can see that on page 608. The other division is your vascular plants. Vascular plants themselves are going to be taller. Remember I said last time non-vascular are going to more, more or less blanket areas. They're going to grow wider. Um, whereas the vascular plants have vascular tissue. Things like xylem that transfers water up. Phloem that transfers food down. Uh, because they are taller. So they have the vascular tissue. There's two types of vascular plants. There's your seedless plants. And those are things like fern, horsetail, and club moss. I want you to know the phyla name Terrafite. Uh, I'll pull out the highlighter here so you guys can see this. Terrafite's there, bryophytes there. Um, and then there are also seed vascular plants. Now seed vascular plants come in two types. Gymnosperms. And I don't put the phyla names, but they really resemble these names. There's coniferophyte, aginkophyte, anetophyte, cicatophyte. Uh, I don't know if I said that right, I apologize, but these are your four phyla of gymnosperms. Spruce trees are really the main ones in our area, and those are conifers. So spruce is a conifer. Um, again, looking at page 608 and throughout that section of your book, it explains that stuff in more detail. Angiosperms, on the other hand, are going to be uh, really, most of the plants you think of are angiosperms, crops, flowers, foods we eat, grasses. Um, those are all going to be your angiosperms, and a lot of them begin uh, belong to the phyla anthophyte. So I want you to know that name. Um, so a couple phyla that I threw your way, anthophyte are most of your angiosperms. Coniferophyta, or conifers, conifers, excuse me, are the ones that are generally in our area for the gymnosperms. These are going to be cone-bearing plants. Terophytes are your fern and bryophytes are your moss. So some phyla name to go along with this. Again, I really encourage you to look through page 608 to, uh, to get an understanding of what that all, uh, how this all shakes out. But study this. Um, here's, here's your first three questions. I've got three pictures on here, one, two, and three. Uh, when you email me, you can put one, the answer, two, the answer, three, the answer. Each one of these is two parts. You're going to tell me if it's vascular or non-vascular and if it's seed or seedless. So two words with everything. Uh, send that to me. I'm going to keep going. If you need to take some time, go ahead and pause it here. Uh, and then for number four uh, and number five, here you're telling me. So basically, I'm giving you the answer that these are both vascular seed plants. Number four and number five, I want you to tell me, is it a gymnosperm or is it an angiosperm? All right, so your gymnosperms, you can look in your book and see a little bit about those. Your angiosperms, you can do the same. Go ahead and answer these questions. Now, something I want to mention to you in addition to number four and five is uh, just for fun, uh, we know that our gym, uh, excuse me, our, our, uh, one of these types of plants we use for a Christmas tree. Uh, so just for the heck of it, tell me what you put on your Christmas tree. Do you put an angel? Do you put a star? Do you not have a tree? Do you put nothing on it? 
you know, let's just have a little bit of fun with that. Um, and one thing that I'll note about this slide too that is that is kind of interesting when it comes to landscaping and planting um, different varieties of, of uh, plants, maybe for landscaping, um, is that some plants can be male or female version or produce a more abundant amount of male cones versus female cones. Um, and that's kind of interesting because if I am... If I have allergies, which some of you guys might have allergies, uh, would you want to have a male plant out front or a female plant out front? I'll let you think about that. The answer is males will produce a bunch of pollen and that's what ultimately creates our allergies. So if I'm sensitive to uh, you know, pollen and I, and, I, and I face a lot of difficulties throughout the spring of the year, um, I would want to plant a female plant uh, because that's not going to be releasing the pollen that causes the allergic reactions or the, the, the different uh, issues um, in the spring of the year. So uh, males produce a lot of the pollen. Females don't produce that pollen. They, of course, are taking some of it in. Uh, but that's an interesting note that I wanted to throw your way when it comes to plants. So answer four and five. Uh, whether it's gymnosperm or an angiosperm, that's all you put, and then you can add your piece to the to the Christmas tree uh, for number four. Number six. All right, so you guys might know what this is. If you are uh, if you ever around Coach Heinze or you are on the track team, we of course switch gears here. I got my water the bamboo shirt on. Water the bamboo is a phrase that old uh, Mr. Heinze came up with, and it's kind of a neat phrase because if you look at this bamboo plant. Uh, one thing we know about bamboo is that we need to water it, um, but, the, but the thing with watering a bamboo is after you water it day after day after day after day, we don't see a lot of growth early on. You might have to water it for weeks or months or even a year before we really see a lot of growth with a bamboo plant. And a lot of plants, that's true. Um, you're not going to see from Monday to Tuesday a huge amount of growth, but bamboos seem to kind of take that to a to a whole nother extreme. So in the sports world, we of course use that motto as if you're lifting on Monday, you're not going to see your gains on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or not even the week after that or two weeks after that. Um, so we talk about watering the bamboo because when you water the bamboo, it might take months or a year before we really, really see that gain. You'll see the gain if you're consistent just like a bamboo is going to see that gain if you're consistently watering it. So we like to use that analogy. Um, I thought it'd be fun to throw in a bamboo plant so you guys could see what it was in question number six is tell me if it's a gymnosperm or if it's an angiosperm. So you can go ahead and pause if you need to do some investigating on that. I'll give you one hint with the bamboo. Um, that, that hint is it does flower. So you can pause and answer that. Make sure you email all these questions in one email, please. Uh, number seven, I just wanted to give a recap of that whole haploid and diploid gametophyte sporophyte idea. Um, if you're in your book, um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to make mention before I even get to this slide, page 651 is definitely worth looking over when it comes to the tropism. So take a look at page 651. That's a great uh, page, like I said. Um, and then you can turn to page 663 right now. And on page 663, I've got a, a breakdown there, or the book has a breakdown there, of the diploid and haploid series of alternation of generations. So I encourage you to read through alternations of generations. Um, and here you can see the gametophyte stage, I will make note, is not a dominant stage in a plant's life. It's the sporophyte stage that really plants spend the majority of their life in. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned that piece one more time. Um, and then for seven and eight, it's as easy as tell me seven is the haploid what, and I think I already gave that answer away, stage, and eight is the diploid blank stage. So for seven or eight, you're simply putting if it's, if I'm talking gametophyte or sporophyte. And then another note again, this is a bryophyte. So you might in your head already know that this is what, hopefully you're saying out loud, this is a moss plant. Um, so that's your bryophyte there. And then your gymnosperms are your cone-bearing plants. Your angiosperms are your, your plants that are going to flower in some way. 
Uh, so gymnosperms and angiosperms are both vascular seed plants. Here's your fern, and that's again a vascular seedless plant. So a couple little review things there. Keeping on going, there's a, there's a couple of ideas that I didn't get into a lot in the last video, and I think that you should turn your books to page 672 and 673 um, at some point and make sure you get a good review of these. The names are pretty straightforward, but when we talk about flowering plants, uh, we can categorize them based on how much light they need before they flower. So there are long day flowering plants, which as the name implies, requires more light in order for them to flower. There are short day, which requires not a lot of light. They actually want more darkness. Um, there's day neutral, which is kind of like they don't really care. They could flower whether there's a lot of light or not a lot of light. Um, and then there's intermediate day. I'm gonna come back to intermediate day. Uh, think about what another name for long day and short day plants could be because we sometimes hear of them called another name for long day would be short night or another name for short day could be long night. So we sometimes hear those terms switched around a little bit, but ultimately what it comes down to is how much light does a plant need in order to flower. And again, since we're talking flowering plants, we're talking angiosperms. Now I said I'd come back to intermediate day. The intermediate day plants, these plants require very close to 12 hours of sunlight. So where would we find an intermediate day plant? Well, usually these are your tropical plants because those plants along the equator uh, really are always going to be in, you know, really no less than 11 hours of light and no more than 13 hours of light because there's not a lot of variation along the equator. So intermediate day plants are generally going to be all the plants that like to live in the tropical areas. Another note that I'll make down here on the bottom, and I'm going to use my highlighter again, is the annuals versus the biannuals. Sorry about the yellow, it doesn't come up real good. Uh, annuals are plants that flower one time and then they die. Perennials are going to flower over many seasons. This is important in a lot of people who like to, they, they have flower beds or they landscape because there's advantages and disadvantages to both of these. Someone who plants annuals, the advantage of that would be they get to have unique flowers every single season. So if they, if they want to change it up from season to season, they can get a new plant because the, the plant is going to flower one time and then it's going to die. So next spring, that plant will be gone. Perennials, on the other hand, they will continue to flower over and over and over again. So the advantage with these is I don't have to replant them every year. When I, uh, when I plant a perennial, uh, I know that it's going to continue to come back over and over and over again. You maybe have heard of perennial powers in different uh, athletic venues. Um, the perennial power is saying they're back. They're going to come back year after year after year. Um, so that word perennial means the, the the plant is going to flower over and over and over again. So number nine and 10, give me an example for number nine of an annual. And number 10, give me an example of a perennial. And what I'm looking for, are plants around our area. So give me a, a number nine annual in our area and a perennial in our area. You can't use grass, okay? But think to yourself, what is grass? Is that an annual or a perennial? Some of you might be thinking grass isn't even an angiosperm because it doesn't flower. Well, grass does flower, so it is an angiosperm, um, and it is a perennial because it comes back every year. Boy, that would be a pain. If grass was an annual, we'd have to replant our yards every single year. I had to do that once, and let me tell you, it was not fun. Planting, planting grass is not, not, a yard is not very fun to do. So uh, just wanted to show my face again so you remembered who was giving you this wonderful lecture. Uh, we're going to continue on here. Now we're going to go to uh, some of the parts of the flower. So number 11 is I want you to label A through J and I'm going to go through the reproduction of this. So I'm going to give away a lot of answers as you guys are listening here. Um, but this is one of the last things I wanted to go through with you is the reproduction of uh, specifically in this case angiosperms. So angiosperms, first of all, have these really, really brightly colored petals. And I'm going to make this flower red because, um, you know, we like red flowers. So this is, this is a petal. What's the purpose of a petal 
Well, a petal is there ultimately to attract a pollinator in most cases, whether it be by scent or by nice color. Um, that's why many of our flowers are going to smell good. I'm not going to take time to color this in. It's not a great coloring job, but you get the idea. So the petals are there to attract a pollinator. Now, if it gets a pollinator that comes on in here, the pollinator usually is going to be digging around in this area for nectar. Now, that's kind of a, a trick for the plant. It wants to supply a food source for that that you know bee or moth or butterfly or hummingbird or whatever because as that animal is digging around within this plant it has this thing here which is called the filament and it's sticking a bunch of pollen on that particular uh, on that particular animal so the filament is plastering up pollen all over the animal as it's getting nectar around and hoping that 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 insect or whatever that animal is flies off goes to another plant and when it comes back uh, by the way, the filament is a part of the male reproductive organ of the flower, which is letter G, the whole male reproductive organ. Um, as it flies to the next flower, going back to that animal, this part here is called the stigma. Letter D is the stigma, and it's sticky, and it starts to pull that pollen off of the animal because in the pollen is sperm. And that sperm then, once it's, or that pollen, once it's pulled off, uh, the sperm will break out of the case of the of pollen and it will swim down this uh, which I which is the style I always remember the style because it swims down the style in style to the ovule this is the ovule here letter A is the ovule um, and in the ovule is an egg now once it swims down to that egg we get ourselves a seed and the seed then consists of and I talked about this in the last PowerPoint so I won't go to, into it in a whole lot of detail you get your little embryo which is the radical turns into the root the stem turns into the stem and the plumule turns into the leaf it's surrounded with a cotyledon a food source uh, cotyledon is the food source and a seed coat which protects it um, that then is dispersed sometimes it's dispersed as just a seed sometimes it's produced or dispersed as as a, a seed um, it might be dispersed like with grass it's going to be dispersed just by the wind the wind is going to blow those seeds if you've ever seen grass seed it's tiny tiny little seed and it's going to uh, it's going to disperse that just the wind is going to blow that seed wherever it needs to go um, sometimes the seeds are dispersed by animals maybe they eat the fruit and then they leave and then they defecate out the the seed into another area and then it will uh, go into the ground and eventually germinate into a new plant uh, sometimes it might be water one of the one of the my favorite biology questions on the test has to do with how do coconuts disperse their seeds and i want you to do me a favor and i want you to google coconut seed dispersal uh, and you'll see a whole bunch of pictures that should come up hopefully they come up about how coconuts disperse their disperse their seeds so that's another little hint for you coming into the test um, later on this week so as i was saying Seeds are, seeds are made, that ultimately is the baby, that then goes out and creates another plant. So label A through J here and, uh, and, and pick three parts, uh, I didn't mention this yet, uh, but pick three parts that you can give the function of. So you don't have to give the function of all ten of the parts you're labeling here, but pick three of them and give me the function of that. So those are your 11 questions that you're going to need to complete and email to me when you're all done. Um, again, email me those by Wednesday at 1159. Uh, you have a test that's due on Thursday at 1159. If you've stuck with me this long, I'll give you an answer. Number 50 is what this presentation was. This presentation was Plantastic. P-L-A-N-T-A-S-T-I-C. Plantastic is the answer for number 50. Thanks everybody for hanging along with me. Bonus point, rate my mustache. It's probably going to come off because my wife's not a big fan. But if it's a, if you rake it a 10, it's like, don't ever take that sucker off, Mr. A. You look really good. If it's a 1, then uh, that means you, know, you never want to see me with a mustache ever again. Bonus on your email. Send that in as well. Uh, truth be told, I'm probably going to go shave it right now. Have a good day, everybody.